Project to modernize the public health law of New York City, and he worked with every division, bureau, and unit of the then Department of Health, and uh, doing that, learned the value of the department's uh, work from inside out, and he brought to bear modern principles of law and societal norms, and converted the New York Sanitary Code into the New York City Health Code, and this was adopted by the Board of Health in 1959. It contains such principles which still guide us today as no person shall fail to do any reasonable act or take any reasonable precaution to protect human life and health. Uh, this is still embodied in our current health code which, to which uh, Professor Grad also contributed uh, when it was recently updated. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Grad during that period and uh, he died at the age of 90, so he, was, he lived a long life, and it made me realize he was only in his 30s uh, when he uh, provided the foundation that still guides us today in the uh, modern New York City Health Code. Uh, he um, went on to a very um, uh, continued pioneering work in the area of public health law, uh, and environmental health law. And nearly 40 years later, he then worked with uh, Wilfredo <coughs> Lopez, then the general counsel here, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and to um, re-update and modernize again the health code. And Wilfredo Lopez was honored to write the introduction to the third edition of his uh, seminal public health um, manual. So we are today remembering him always as a pioneer and revered ancestor of this department. Uh, so let me then uh, move on to, um, to our first order of business this morning, which is to approve the me minutes from the last meeting. These were rather voluminous. And, uh, and uh, may I ask if there were any any, I'm turning to you. I have a motion to approve the minutes so and a second. Second. And uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So we have a motion, uh, we have approved the minutes and let's move on to our business of the day. The first is a resolution to amend articles 205 and 207 of the health code regarding records of death information. The notice was published in the city record on October 14th. The public hearing was held on November 14th. Uh, there, no one testified, and there were no written public comments received. Um, do we have a presentation? We have a commentary. My name is Stephen Schwartz. I'm the uh, New York City Registrar of Vital Statistics. I wanted to call to the board's attention a few minor changes uh, based on comments made during the board meeting. And they apply to uh, section 207.13 of the health code. Uh, the we added a few things uh, based on the minor things. 
Uh, the issue has to do with our providing uh, a system, an electronic system, for verification of births and deaths. Uh, one of the questions that came up was, could it be, could the system be used more broadly than just by a physician licensed to practice in the U.S. who demonstrates that such information is needed to determine whether a patient he or she is treating has died? We added another one based on discussion at the board meeting that it would also include a hospital that demonstrates, as opposed to just the physician, that a hospital demonstrates that such information is needed to determine whether a patient it is treating has died. We also added that the system itself uh, in the health code, that it is, that it will be used in a manner and in a manner described within the health code. So the system itself is not yet ready. We are planning to use a national system to provide this service, both locally and nationally. And at this point, the system isn't cooked. It will be. And when it is ready, we will make it available as we have proposed in the health code. So with that, are there any questions for? Are there any questions for Dr. Schwartz and the board? It's open for board consideration. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for that adjustment. I think I might have raised that issue, um, and I think it will be very helpful. Do you know when the system might? What's the plan for when the system might be available? We are hoping it will be available within 2015. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from the board? <coughs> uh, so we have a, mo motion. To a motion to adopt. Yep. Yeah. So All in favor? Aye. So the motion is approved, and the uh, amendments to Articles 205 and 207 are adopted. Uh, we'll proceed now. Thank you. We'll proceed now to uh, the proposed. Uh, resolution to amend uh, Article 207, Section 207.05, uh, to remove the convertive surgery requirement for transgender birth certificates. This was published in the city record on October 14th. A public hearing was held <coughs> on the 17th of November. There were 13, 13 people testified at that time, and uh, there were nine written comments. <coughs> Dr. Vanderwey. Hi, my name is Gretchen Van Wy. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Vital Statistics here at the Health Department. Um, and I just wanted to summarize the nature of the comments um, on the proposal. Um, all, of the, all of the comments were in favor of the, of the proposed change. Um, and 14 of the commenters also requested the addition of licensed master social workers to those who can file an affidavit to attest that the applicant's requested correction of sex designation accurately reflects the applicant's gender identity. So I really just want to add one more professional. The department recommends the addition of LMSWs to the extent that such responsibility is within their scope of practice. Uh, the, uh, this is open now to the board for consideration. Everybody agreeable to that? All right, then we will move on to a, uh, a motion to adopt. A motion. A second. Second. And all in favor. Aye. The motion carries, and the proposed amendment is adopted. Uh, we're now going to move on to some new items, uh, which will uh, be considered by the board for approval for publication. Uh, the first one is a uh, resolution to amend Article 47. Uh, um, uh, daycare services um, uh, for um, we have two presentations I believe uh, beginning with Frank Pichello of the Bureau of Child Care and then Dr. Sonia Angel if you could introduce yourself Hi, good morning. Um, 
I'm Frank Cachillo, the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Child Care. I turn the mic on. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Sonia Angel, the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Prevention and Primary Care. And we're here today seeking the board's approval for public comment on a number of changes to R-47 of the New York City Health Code. Uh, we're proposing amendments to strengthen the requirements around child supervision and accountability uh, at arrival, uh, departure time, off-site uh, activities, and during transportation. We're also proposing a number of revisions to the nutritional, physical activity, and screen time provisions uh, in the code. From 2008 through 2013, the department has received 96 reports of lost children, an average of 16 <coughs> per year. We define a lost child as a child who is unaccounted for <coughs> or supervised by childcare staff for any period of time. Uh, the most common lost child circumstances are children wandering out of the child care facility, children lost during lost site trips, children lost within the facility, and children lost during transportation or left unattended in a vehicle. Since 2008, the department has taken a number of steps to address this issue short of a, a regulatory solution. At the beginning of the NOA, we developed a new protocol for response and assessment of lost child complaints focused on the systemic nature of such incidents and established a standardized approach to the investigation of these complaints. We also conducted lost child prevention training for child care centers citywide and developed a template for child care centers to use in the development of lost child prevention protocols. However, the number of uh, such complaints remains unacceptably high. Therefore, we're proposing the, the following revisions. We're seeking to enhance the requirements of child accountability and supervision during arrival and departure. Programs would be required to maintain daily attendance records that must include each child's name, arrival and departure time, and the name and signature of individuals who escort a child to and from child care. Programs would also be required to maintain a list of names and contact information of all persons authorized by parents to escort children from child care and not release any child to a person who is not authorized as for a child. We would require child care centers to contact the child's parent within one hour of a child's scheduled arrival time to determine the cause of the child's absence. And, and programs would be required to inform parents when children are initially enrolled that they must notify the center of any scheduled or unscheduled child absences. We'd also require programs to monitor entrances and exits, either by using individual staff, contractors, or by electronic surveillance. They would need to maintain unobstructed views of entrances and exits, install panic bars in all exterior doors, to secure all entrances with passkey identification or other means that limit access to, to authorized persons. We also are seeking to enhance the requirements for child accountability and supervision during off-site trips and activities. We would require a trip coordinator during all lost site trips who maintain overall child supervision and staff oversight. Programs would have to have a child accountability system, basically a name to face head count uh, at required times, and would need to provide clothing or some other item for each child that identifies the child care center name and contact information. If a program implies or contracts with the transportation service, a daily trip log must be maintained documenting the name of children transported, arrival and departure dates and time, names of transportation staff, and identifying information for the transportation service itself. During arrival and departure, child care centers must conduct name-to-face visual identification and confirmation of each child received from or delivered to a driver. They must also provide the driver with a daily log of children scheduled to receive transportation. We would require criminal background checks and child abuse screening for personnel transporting children that are under contract to or employed by the child care center. This would exclude uh, from screening requirements persons providing transportation arranged privately by, by parents. We just have a couple of additional unrelated revisions that we're seeking. We would allow children and staff medical records to be maintained in an electronic format. Currently it's paper-based and must be on site. Uh, we would allow the use of pillows for children older than two years of age, and we would re 
require exit signs to be illuminated, and that's to be consistent with the uh, New York City Building Code. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Angel, is now going to present the uh, proposed revisions for nutrition, physical activity, and screen time. So thank you. It's um, a pleasure to present to you these um, we think important uh, proposed modifications and amendments to the health code that focus on uh, children in daycare centers related to nutrition and physical activity. We know that daycare centers serve as a kind of second home to many of our youth, and so setting healthy patterns when they're young can set them up to be healthy adults. Specifically, we propose amendments in three specific areas related to nutrition and physical activity. It includes reducing the amount of juice served to children, limiting the amount of time children spend being sedentary, and limiting children's exposure to screen time. So um, I don't need to tell anybody that obesity is one of the greatest problems that we're facing nationally as well as in New York City with uh, over 20% of our adults obese. And we know that obesity starts at a young age. Among our preschoolers enrolled in uh, WIC programs in New York City, we know that 14.5% of those three-year-olds and 16.9% of four-year-olds were obese in uh, 2011. And obese children are at high risk to become obese adults. In fact, overweight five-year-old children are four times more likely to become, uh, than uh, normal weight children to become obese um, by uh, eighth grade. And the risk of adult obesity is at least twice as high for obese children as for non-obese children. So in 2006, the board adopted a number of very important amendments to improve nutrition and physical activity in child care centers. And it required that the center serve only healthy beverages. Those beverages were defined as uh, water, um, milk is less than 1%, and 100% fruit juice. Uh, it required that um, at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day was provided, um, that uh, sedentary time was limited to less than or equal to 60 minutes at a time, and that uh, it limited screen time to less than or equal to 60 minutes per day for children over two years old. Um, and some background on the impact of that, an evaluation that was conducted of the um, 2006 regulations revealed that there was broad adherence to healthy beverage regulations in daycare centers and also to screen time regulations, as well as moderate adherence to physical activity regulations. So we've made uh, a bit of a difference here. This in combination also with the number of activities that the uh, health department and the city at large has introduced to address obesity seems to be making a bit of a difference. Um, in 2002, 18% of our um, children ages 2 to 4 enrolled in WIC were obese, and we've seen a decline in that to 13.9%, but I think we would all agree that 13.9% is still much too high for these children, and we can do much better. So we'd like to propose um, a few amendments, and I'll go through and specify them here clearly. So currently related to juice, only 100% juice is allowed, which we, uh, of course, we continue. We'd like to limit, uh, increase the age at which juice is allowed, however, uh, from eight months of age to two years of age. Um, and also we uh, propose limiting the portion size of juice that's uh, allowable in daycare centers from six ounces per day to uh, reducing it to four pound ounces per day. Uh, the rationale and justification for that this comes from a number of different environments, including um, a number of our um, expert bodies that say that uh, juice intake, the portion sizes, should be limited um, in, uh, for children, even when it's 100% juice. Um, it can 100% uh, uh, fruit juice. It confers no add, uh, additional value over whole fruit. In fact, um, juice often lacks the fiber, so it's a less healthy alternative to whole fruit. Um, RWJ Foundation healthier beverage recommendations include limiting the juice to four ounces maximum per day um, of 100% fruit juice for ages two to four. So what we're proposing is consistent with that. Um, we know that children who consume juice typically consume quantities that far exceed those rec recommended limits anyway, and this limit clearly applies to the daycare setting itself. Um, the it's also, the, this limit is consistent with the New York State Child and Adult Care Food Program, which actually reimburses for four ounce servings of juice. So that puts us in line with it. Physical activity limits on television viewing. So um, we would like to recommend reducing the amount of television uh, viewing allowed in daycare centers, which is currently 60 minutes per day to 30 minutes per week. Again, this is strongly supported by numerous health experts that recommend that child care centers limit screening to uh, television screen time <coughs> to this uh, amount of time. Um, we know that children are exposed to uh, screens and, and other um, 
television, other videos in multiple settings throughout the day. Um, and surveys have demonstrated that children actually get two to three hours of television viewing per day. So limiting it in the daycare center um, will help us achieve the recommended limit per day that children have, which is less than one to two hours per day, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we know this is an important thing to do because increased screen time exposure in early childhood is related to increased BMI and increased risk of overweight and obesity later in childhood and in adulthood. Um, and then finally, we, uh, we'd like to recommend uh, limits on the amount of sedentary time that's allowed. Um, it, but currently, it reads that children are not, are not to remain sedentary or sit passively for more than 60 minutes continuously. And I just want to note that this is uh, except during scheduled nap time. Um, and we would like to recommend reducing that to 30 minutes. Again, strong support for that. The IOM recommends that toddlers and preschoolers in childcare settings do not passively sit or stand for more than 30 minutes at a time. Um, studies show that children spend the majority of their time in preschool and childcare settings being sedentary, so it's a very important area to pay attention to. And we know that sedentary activities can take the place of time that could be otherwise spent um, being physically active or otherwise engaged, and that's um, very important in terms of setting patterns for um, behavior that can last a lifetime. So in conclusion, our proposed amendments build upon the success of prior efforts to provide healthy environments for young children in child care settings. And child care settings really should represent the gold standard for physical activity, nutrition, and other healthy lifestyle habits. And by proposing these three amendments, we're working towards getting us to that standard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if that concludes the presentations, we're now open for discussion and comment on the board. <coughs> Uh, thank you both. I have a couple of questions for Assistant Commissioner Krishulo. Um, what is your sense from the uh, field, you know, inspections that you and your staff have done? How many uh, centers are already in compliance with what you're proposing, and what would be the economic or other impact of the proposal? <clears throat> so I don't think we have a very good sense of uh, how the compliance to these, these programs would be with all of the new um, provisions that we're proposing. Uh, we did some estimates on cost, and it really comes down to how the programs uh, decide to um, monitor their entrances and exits. Uh, there's a low cost sort of a kit that you can use to get a, the push bar, or you can replace an entire door. I'd imagine most would choose to just get a kit and place it onto the uh, onto the doors. We're estimating this based on two doors, of course, an entrance and a secondary means of egress. If a program has more than two, the problems, of course, increase substantially the cost. So uh, a, a kit for a, a push bar costs about $70. Um, the pesky identification system ranges from anywhere from about $200 to $350. And uh, electronic surveillance starts at about $180. So uh, if they decide to do it with staffing, it may, of course, in the long term be more costly. If they decide to go with electronic surveillance, it would be more of a one-time cost. So we're estimating, based on two doors per, per uh, program, uh, the cost would be between be between be four hundred and fifty dollars and eight hundred dollars per per center. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up with that. Um, some of your regulations seem focused on proposals. Were focused on the. Um, the doors um, and monitoring the doors, and others were focused on maintaining lists of uh, every child who was boarding a bus and the face-to-face -face, um, confirmation. I wondered if the what your sense was of the adherence to the latter set of regulations. Not about the doors, but about transportation and checking each kid and maintaining lists every day. Are, is this something that's standard in daycare now? Uh, I, I think uh, for the better pro better run programs and higher end programs, it's mostly standard. It's very good practice, and they all maintain it. And for sort of the, the big range programs and the lower performing programs, it's not. So we should provide the same level of safety across the board, regardless of you know the, the program that the child's attending. You said that about 16 children were lost each year during the period you were monitoring. Have, do you have any information about? what sort of lapses were related to those lost children? In other words, you know, that's a lot. And it, did that help you uh, design these new changes? It did. And I should say all the children did return safely, so there's nothing happening to them. They were returned by, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, members of the public or the police. 
I should say a little something about that later on. But uh, over 50% of all the lost child cases involve children just walking right out of the facility. Uh, that's a little bit different from early on in 2008, 2009, where the majority of the children were lost in parks. So we did see a positive impact of all of our training. Unfortunately, because that was the main reason for a child being lost, our training was, was focused and presented around not losing children in public parks or anywhere else in the county. So we saw a drop in that and a big increase in children just wandering out of facilities. Uh, you know, 10 percent of the time, children are left with vans. You see the news reports. Uh, so we, we're trying to put something here to address that. Again, the better run programs, of course, have those things in place, uh, and others just don't. So we think it needs to be regulated and, and required. Thank you. Dr. Richardson. Thank you for your presentation, and, and uh, uh, I'm, as usual, quite impressed with the thoughtfulness of the proposals. I, I do have some questions. Could you perhaps define for me what sedentary is? Sometimes uh, the wording is sitting or standing passively, and sometimes it's sedentary. I'm, I'm trying to understand what that means. Sure, it's described as uh, sitting or standing passively. And essentially, it's meaning not being actively engaged uh, in um, uh, uh, th um, activities that would increase your movement. So if I'm reading to a group of children and they're sitting on the floor and listening, that's sedentary activity? That would be defined as sedentary, and that would be allowed, but, but limited to 30 minutes at one setting. Okay, if they're working on a puzzle together, that's sedentary. I, I mean, I'm just trying I, to get a yeah. sense because I, I mean, I certainly understand all of our uh, concerns about obesity and increasing physical activity and movement, especially in young children. But I wouldn't want it to be at the expense of developing analytic ability or artistic. Um, uh, development, and I'm I'm I, I'm just wondering where the balance is. That I, I don't think children, and even three-year-olds, need to be actively moving, you know, 16 hours a day in order to be healthy. And I'm a little worried that other valuable pursuits that <coughs> contribute to a child's development are now being limited in favor of an emphasis on physical activity. I appreciate your comment. Um, child development specialists um, sort of discuss this quite commonly. And it's recognized that during this time period, it's a very important period for locomotor and um, uh, sort of hand-eye um, coordination development. And so this is something that children of this age um, should be engaged in. It's true that there are different developmental stages that children go through. But by and large, the recommendations come from um, specialists in the field that realize that once kids do start uh, regular school, this will not impair their capacity to be able to yeah, engage in activities that require them to sit for longer times. And in fact, it sets them up well to be able to continue to develop uh, progressively. I think what I'm hearing also from you is uh, a, uh, a desire for more specific definition of what sedentary, sedentary means. And I think in the literature, it's a little bit, um, it's, it's not as clear. But let me just check with my colleagues if there is a further debate on this. I think it's something that we can clarify for you. Hey, Mario, you yeah. have to yeah. introduce yourself. And speak right. I'm uh, Maura Canelli, and I'm the Director of Policy for the Bureau of Chronic Disease Prevention and Tobacco Control. Um, I think we're happy to, to go back and define it for you and look at if it should be defined more clearly in the health code as well. Um, for clarification purposes, we have um, discussed with our colleagues at the Department of Education and in other child care settings. And by in part, most curriculums for this age group also have short period, um, you know, educational programming that, that in fact, you know, they are not, uh, there is, there isn't kind of any sort of even, um, they're not having children sit reading for longer than 30 minutes at a time because it's age appropriate for this, this, uh, this period of time for kids to be, um, you know, moving from activity to activity. And so, by and large, you know, the sedentary behavior is already in line with 30 minutes at a time. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, I, I guess what's troubling me is the suggestion that anything that doesn't involve physical movement does not have value for young children. And there might be activities that have value 
that occur when they are not being physically active and, and I'm just concerned that we're devaluing things that would uh, contribute to other aspects of a child's development. And I, I agree with you that 30 minutes, if you can get a kid that age to do anything for more than 30 minutes, good luck. But, but I do think sometimes they might be engaged in, in activities and Again, it's it's the um, somewhat, uh, I guess, it, it's not, I'm not troubled by the focus on anti-obesity uh, initiatives, but the lack of appreciation that there are many other things that need to be tended to uh, in a child's development. And I'm, I'm concerned that people um, who see this will start to really just focus, as long as I keep them moving, I'm doing a good job, and I don't actually have to engage them in anything that requires mental ability or uh, allows them appreciation of, uh, of art or music. And so I, I'm just worried that we're, we're missing the balance and, and the different kinds of um, childhood intelligences that we should be developing. You know, for a long time, we were very narrowly focused on academics. And now we're all very focused on physical activity and there's a lot more to it, and I, I guess I'm a little worried that sedentary is bad and anything that we're not moving becomes bad. So, maybe clarification would help. So, well, I can also offer what I'm hearing from you also is that it's a question of the duration of time that they spend sedentary. That there might be, if they would have spent an hour instead of 30 minutes, there might have been some greater gain in this uh, perhaps uh, activity. So, we can also look closely at the literature to see. Uh, once again, the premise of these recommendations to be sure that we're not missing absolutely anything that might lead to less development in, uh, in those specific areas. Yeah. I think there's something said for learning to concentrate on something I, for I periods think, of time. I, if they're always jumping up and down, then they never learn to do that. <laughs> I guess that's what it So it's the 30 minutes that you're specifically questioning that, that all <clears throat> activities should be in that chunk of time. For example, if a child is really having a great time painting something, that when, when the clock hits 30 minutes, right, you're they asking the question, does, the, does this then require that that child be told that they have to stop? I think that's so, my concern, that everything that doesn't involve physical activity becomes bad and becomes very limited, and that that may not actually be appropriate. So that's clear to the program, and mm -hmm. yeah. thank you for thank that you. comment. Dr. Gavin, did you have another one? Hi, I want to thank both of you for this uh, very thoughtful proposal that we could uh, really potentially improve uh, the health of New Yorkers dramatically. Uh, a couple questions. One is um, uh, you've, you've created some pretty uh, aggressive limitations on TV watching, which I think is very visionary. Um, have you thought about um, whether some of these daycare centers are also uh, using any, any gaming uh, with their children, using iPads or video games, and whether uh, there's any provisions around the, the time use of those, or is there a consideration that those are more interactive and there's less risk involved? Those, those points, yeah, those that's are, the, that time that they're spent gaming is part of screen time, so that's also included in this limitation here. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, the other question is, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the, the activities of all these, all these daycare centers are, but uh, if, if there were daycare centers now that, that are spending a great deal of time on TV watching or on sedentary activities and through these uh, provisions would need to change their programming considerably, um, is, is there any guidance that will be provided by the Department of Health that might offer some best practices that, that are evidence-based that might result in better outcomes for our kids? Yeah, thank you for that question. In fact, after the 2000, sort of concurrent with the 2006 program, we had activities and training um, uh, daycare center uh, workers to be um, to engage uh, folks in more active um, play through um, programming. That programming has sort of evolved actually into a DOE um, activity, and we've introduced another uh, 100 daycare centers similar activity to help train those centers. I will say that it's very important to us that any of regulations that we introduce, people can comply with them, not just to meet this, the regulation, but because the whole spirit is improving health. So as we move forward, we see that there are challenges. We will continue to evolve in our programming to make sure that people can actually introduce these in a more um, sustainable way. 
<clears throat> I'd also add that you know the Chalker Bureau has early childhood educational consultants that visit these programs on a regular basis during the year, and part of their job is to provide technical assistance around uh, how to operate the program in the most beneficial way to kids and the curriculum and things of that nature. And if they observe something that is not to the advantage of children, they do advise on site uh, the program on how they can better provide uh, services. Okay, thank you. And the, the, the last question relates to if, if this proposal is passed, uh, what is your plan um, to monitor compliance and what are the potential penalties if uh, daycare centers are not in compliance? Uh, <clears throat> so we would give the, as far as the uh, accountability supervision of children, we would give programs at least a year to come into compliance with the door requirements, uh, the push bars and things of that nature. Uh, but, and we conduct on-site inspections yearly, and we would check for all of these things within the book of the nutritional uh, new requirements as well as all the accountability and supervision. And we do on-site reviews of logs and things of that nature, so. Are there any other questions from the board? Oh. Okay. I apologize, but I'm being late. Uh, what, in what category are these skin lesions like uh, bed bugs or scabies in a given daycare center? What category would be contagious or contagious? Can you just clarify the question? No, if it's, it's going to be checked or report, not report, <coughs> what precaution can be taken if a child has scabies that okay, happens in so school? This is a general question. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a whole list of, of diseases that uh, programs are required to report to the Department of Health uh, upon notification of the use within 24 hours. So. We already have a system in place where there are wards for the of a little disease to address it. And we go on site if necessary. Okay, well, thank you for those presentations. The, the board is asked to approve this um, for public comment. Uh, uh, so it would then subsequently um, uh, the, we'll come back to you, uh, the, the team will come back to you and, and summarize those comments. Uh, so may I ask now for a motion? Uh, to approve uh, this notice of adoption uh, for public comment. And uh, Dr. Gauda, and Second. second by Dr. Foreman, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, unanimous, thank you very much. The motion passes, and thank you. we will post this for public comment. Uh, we are going to move now to item five on our agenda, which is a proposed resolution to amend Article 81. Uh, for food preparation and food establishments. And I believe we have a presentation on this as well. We do this. Uh, Commissioner Elliot Marcus and Michelle Robinson. Michelle Robinson, introduce yourselves for the record and thank you for joining us. Good morning, members of the board. I'm Elliot Marcus, Associate Commissioner for the Bureau of Food Safety and Community Sanitation. Could you turn your mic, your mic on, please? Your mic on. Good morning, members of the board. I'm Elliot Marcus, Commissioner for the Bureau of Food Safety and Community Sanitation. And with me this morning is Michelle Robinson, Director of the Director of the Administration of the Program. Um, we undertook an effort this year to um, revise most of Article 81 to harmonize it with the FDA, the 2013 FDA food code, correct the omissions that were uh, left out in the last revision, and to clarify certain provisions to make them uh, more understandable by our customers, food service establishments. And there are a few, uh, few provisions that will address new practices in the industry, such as um, preparing juice for, uh, for sale to retailers. Um, first, uh, the first amendment is to, about sanitation, sanitization. Uh, we've added an additional method, method for doing this, uh, the use of quaternary ammonium as approved chemical sanitizing uh, solution for tableware, utensils, and equipment. 
Um, this was a minute from the previous uh, amendments to Article 81. It provides another option for food service establishment to sanitize uh, dishware and silverware, paperware. Um, shellfish tags, we're now going to require that shellfish tags be retained for um, scallops with grow. Um, we're also going to require that and make explicit that uh, exotic game animals uh, meat from these animals are obtained from uh, regulated New York State Department of Agriculture Markets uh, facilities. And it's, it, this is consistent with the 2013 code. Approved sources of food, juice. Um, definition of juice has been added here. Um, it's been a relatively new and burgeoning practice of uh, many food service establishments creating juices and then bottling them for sale to third party resellers. Uh, this provision requires a labeling requirement uh, for unpasteurized packaged juice that includes uh, listing the, the ingredients, additives, the name and address of the entity packaging the juice, and the use by date, and a warning statement that the juice has not been pasteurized. Um, Juice, juicing is uh, subject to requirements of juice HACCP regulations. So the uh, FSCs, food service establishments that are, are juicing, would have to submit a plan to us that we would review and approve for creating these products. We further uh, clarified where permits are required, uh, there, was, there was some confusion. So uh, a permit is required to operate a food service establishment or non-retail food processing establishment, including commissaries and shared kitchens. This is really nothing new. It's just a clarification of the old code. And a food service establishment or non-food processing uh, establishment may not operate without a permit uh, without a permit for 21 days after submitting an application. This had been in our code, somehow was omitted during the last revision, so it's back in. We should, and it just means that the day that you submit your application for a permit, you have to wait 21 days before you begin operating or until we've had an opportunity to do a pre permit inspection. So there are uh, pre permit inspections now may be obtained through uh, the new business administration uh, team, and that, as it's commonly known, or through our office. Uh, food Sanitary Preparation Protection Against Contamination, 8107, uh, prohibits storage of unpasteurized liquid, frozen, or dried eggs. Uh, we occasionally find this in establishments, and the claim is always that we don't use them. Um, so just to be clear that when we're not there, they're not being used, we'll prohibit their presence in the establishment. Uh, utensils for dispensing foods must have handles. It's not obvious, but sometimes it doesn't always happen, so we've made it explicit. Uh, and we've added a way of storing utensils so that you can store it now in running water, in the food that's being served, or in the water, uh, in the water at or above 135 degrees. We further clarified when gloves should be used. There's a lot of confusion in the industry about the use of gloves. Gloves are put on at the beginning of the day taken off sometimes at the end of the day. That consideration of what's transpired between preparing food. So uh, we've, we've made explicit that you must change your gloves after handling raw foods, performing tasks that do not involve food preparation or processing, handling garbage or uh, any other work where gloves may have become soiled or contaminated. Uh, single service items, similarly, there was a petition to the board around proprietary coffee lid dispenser. Um, we just generalized the requirement and made it clear that you uh, have to store single service items in a way that uh, doesn't lead to the contamination. And we put back into the code the requirement that um, utensils are stored with the business side down 
container. So if you're grabbing the handle and not the cards on the floor for the stool. Potentially hazardous or temperature controlled for safety foods. So there's a new term in the FDA uh, code called temperature control for safety foods. Uh, and it refers to potentially hazardous foods. So we updated the temperatures for cooking meats to be consistent with the 2013 food code. Uh, we specify minimum temperatures that allow the rare preparations of various types of roasts, not just beef. And um, food not cooked to minimum internal temperatures must have a written consumer advisory as proposed in the new Article 811. <coughs> so, Previous to this, uh, or, or currently, a verbal, a verbal advisory is considered is required. Uh, now, a written advisory would be required. Um, fish for sushi, in particular, and for other raw preparations, must be frozen to uh, destroy parasites before serving it. Uh, Freezing depends on the temperature. The length of freezing depends on, uh, or, or the ability to kill the parasites depends on the temperature, of, uh, temperature time, and the length of time that the fish is being held frozen. So we made those explicit. Uh, potentially hazardous or temperature control for safety foods. Uh, this is continuation. Uh, we, we will require that you have uh, written documentation from the fish provider, the fish retailer, wholesaler, about the fact that the fish was frozen, or you can uh, show us if you're using it on site yourself, which is allowed you to show us your standard operating procedures, written standard operating procedures. For doing so. Time is a public health control. This has been in place for several years now. Uh, we've tried to clarify it for better compliance. Uh, the section <coughs> title has been amended as part of that, and uh, this is an alternative to maintaining time and temperature requirements specified in 8109. The additions are that we will require a date on labels that are placed on foods, and we've made it uh, even clearer that food previously held using time control only cannot be returned to temperature controls. It has to be discarded. So in other words, if you have a food at a temperature for four hours or six hours, at the end of that period of time, that food must be discovered. It cannot be returned to high cold oil. Consumer advisory with notification required. Uh, consuming, this is the notification that will be required. Consuming raw or undercooked <coughs> meats, seafood, shellfish, or eggs may, incre may increase uh, food borne illness. Uh, notice must appear on menus, menu boards, or short signage food labels, uh, table tents, or placards. Verbal advisories may continue until the end of 2015, at which time this written advisory has to be somewhere. Um, food workers' health and hygienic practices. Um, hair restraints. Uh, I think we used to call it head coverings before. Now we've generalized it to hair restraints. And it's not required for council staff when they are preparing or serving beverages or prepackaged foods. Mm -hmm. This applies to bartenders, baristas, hosts, and other waste staff. Before we, uh, the, the regulation, or currently the regulation states that, states the title of the uh, food service worker rather than the actual work they're doing. So if a barista moves to the back of the, uh, the back of the kitchen and starts preparing sandwiches, he now has to done it. Cover. And we added that uh, e-cigarette use is not allowed in establishments, just as smoking is not allowed. Uh, design and construction, 8117. Uh, these clarifications were designed to aid the industry, and it basically says that cutting boards and contact services may be replaced or resurfaced if they can no longer be effectively cleaned and sanitized, which means you can take the wooden cutting board and sand it down so that it's no longer fitted in the grooves. And then uh, do what else you usually do to it, clean it, oil it, and continue using it. Uh, handling toxic hazardous substances in food service establishments. Um, this section was found in 8123 and it's been moved to 8117. As far as proper labeling and proper storage of toxic substances. 
uh, corrections to three sections of the article, uh, cold and hot storage and holding facilities. The is and other temperature measuring devices and hot holding equipment must be calibrated to be accurate within two degrees instead of three degrees. Um, potable water at hand washing sinks. Uh, we used to say water it was required in hand washing sinks, now we're saying potable water needs to be required. Uh, garbage disposal. Um, garbage and waste must be, the current requirement is that garbage and waste must be removed from food service establishments daily or placed in a separate pest proof room. Uh, current proposal is to uh, change that to the garbage and waste be allowed, uh, is allowed to be stored in pest proof containers that do not attract pests, create harborage conditions prior to street placement and pickup. Street placement and pickup takes place at various hours of the day and night, so I want to give a little more flexibility to the requirement. Having a separate storage room in New York City is very difficult, so they're allowing containers, sealed containers. Cleaning premises, equipment and utensils, outdoor cooking, food and beverage preparation. Uh, this 8127 clarifies that cleaning requirements apply to all food contact surfaces. Uh, 8131 prohibits preparation of food on sidewalks, so occasionally or preparation of service of food on sidewalks. Um, currently, there are some food service establishments that illegally decide to set up a barbecue outside their front door, <coughs> uh, roll out an ice cream dispensing freezer and um, serve ice cream in front of the front door without proper permit, permitting or uh, other safety requirements, uh, this will not be prohibited. You can still prepare food outdoors in your own backyard as long as you do other safety requirements, fire and fire building code requirements. Dishwashing and wear washing. Um, this is a fairly big change. Uh, manual dishwashing requires a three compartment sink now before we allowed it in a two compartment sink and this is really to harmonize it with the FDA food code again. Uh, two compartment sinks may be used for glassware and this is to accommodate bar areas where there's not that much space for three compartment sinks. Combination of detergent and sanitizing product may be used according to manufacturer specifications. And only antimicrobial pesticides registered with the US EPA in sufficient amounts to achieve sanitation may be used for manual chemical sanitizing. Uh, refillable returnable containers. Consumers are allowed to bring their own beverage containers and have them refilled at food service establishments. Um, but they will not be allowed to bring bowls or other uh, uh, storage items, products because we didn't feel that we could adequately control for gross contamination. That's the end of our presentation. We'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you for that very uh, thorough presentation. I had a question about uh, what's the usual lag time when you when someone applies for a permit to, in order to receive it, and if there's a, a large percentage of people who have reached that 21 days and they have not been inspected yet? Uh, there are not a large number of people who do that, but the issue here is that you can file a permit months, even years before you open your doors to the public. So whatever we see of, of an application for a permit, we begin checking at the three-month point to see if you're open and operating. As an alternative to that, you can call either our agency or NBAT and request a pre permit uh, inspection, and one won't be supplied within a day or two. Okay, so it's, so okay. it's never really been an issue for us getting out there. We, we, we generally get out within a day to do a pre permit inspection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I always feel like I learn a lot. Minutia from your presentations, but important <laughs> minutia. Um, I just had a question about unpasteurized, unpasteurized juice. Um, have you had any reports of illnesses associated with unpasteurized juice? This is one question. And the other is there was a section that prohibited the storage of unpasteurized juice, yet you said that some establishments 
actually package unpasteurized juice for sale through third parties. So I was a little confused about that. Well, it, it can be stored under refrigeration. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question? Any illnesses associated with the contamination of unpasteurized juice? There have been some, but not a lot. This is a precaution because this is a growing practice now. We're concerned that not everybody will be as safe about doing this. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up a second? Just so the difference between two compartment and three compartment sinks and why the FDA made that change, I don't know why, and why you think it's important. I'm going to turn to my colleague, Michelle yeah. Robinson. Uh, the FDA has always required that for manual dishwashing, the FDA has always required for manual dishwashing that there be a three compartment sink, whether you're using hot water or chemical sanitization. Uh, we believed, and we were incorrect, at one point sanit sanitizers used to, on their label, direct you on how to properly use the actual chemical. But they have stopped putting that information on the actual sanitizer. <coughs> so it's now important for us to directly state, if you are using a chemical sanitizer, to have that three compartment sink. Basically, so you can rinse. It. Can you just explain what the three compartments? I can understand okay. one's the wash, the other's the rinse. Can and the just... last compartment, whether you're using heat or chemical, is to sanitize. Did you anticipate this? This sounds like it might be costly for some establishments to upgrade their sinks, or space might be a, an issue. Space may be an issue for um, some establishments, but in 2014, I would like to believe that. Most food establishments are actually using dishwashing machines, mm -hmm. and it's probably some of the smaller establishments where they may have to readjust or move a piece of equipment to actually get in a three compartment sink. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Christopher and Dr. Kappa. Thank you both. I just wanted to ask you uh, how the, what seems to me like the proliferation of food trucks in the city will be impacted by these uh, proposals and what challenges and you know, uh, remedies you would foresee? We actually changed the we actually changed the mobile food vending code in 1989 and most of these requirements are actually uh, there. There are some exceptions that won't apply to uh, mobile food vending trucks, uh, the reusable uh, containers for beverages most likely. Uh, juicing uh, most likely won't be happening on mobile food vending um, carts. And as for the sink requirements, they are required now to wash all of their dishware at the commissary. As far as proliferation is concerned, there was a, a burgeoning uh, industry there food trucks, but I think that it's really calmed down over the last few years. We're not seeing, uh, we're probably seeing a decline in the numbers of food trucks, but uh, we'll be able to better categorize that in the next year or so. Okay, I want to thank you all. Um, I just want to make sure I understand the provision related to reducing uh, contamination with uh, single-use utensils. So my understanding is if the handle is up, it's okay that, that they, would, they would meet that provision. Yes. And, and what about straws now? They're all uh, packaged straws. Is that right? They have to be packaged or in dispensers that uh, avoid the use of your hands. So you know, the lock turns or you press uh, the, the lever and the straw rolls down. Okay, thank you. And did you get the answer to your first question? The, about the handle? Yeah. Okay. What is the 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 Precaution on transportation, let's say, from the fish market, wholesale to the given restaurant. If, in the concept of freezing, uh, can they claim that this is already frozen from 24 hours from the wholesale to the restaurant, or they have to be documented in the restaurant? They can claim it, but they'll have to back that up with a document from the wholesale establishing the fish restaurant. 
at the forum that, that just reminded me, I, I thought I saw a little asterisk with the freezing requirements that exempted tuna. Did I? Yes. Why is that? They don't have the parasites. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the board, Dr. Richardson? Yeah. Uh, again, thank you for a very thorough presentation. There was one bullet on one of the slides which you didn't really talk about, um, and, and I did find it. So this is limitation on services at establishments that cater to individuals at high risk of food-borne illness. This is on page 20. Section 8111, Part C, Paragraph. <coughs> Could you talk a little bit about the rationale for this? Um, we don't, we're not allowing uh, use uh, or serving of you know, undercooked food at establishments that have uh, people that are at greater risk of uh, people in this. That's already the yeah, that's, that's already the requirement, it's not a Oh, it's underlined, so it's underlined, so that's not new? It's, it's underlined because it's in a new um, section, yes. but the whole point, for instance, a senior center or a child care center, we would not, not allow raw undercooked foods. Yeah, there's some reordering there. Yeah, some reordering. So this is an existing section that was just moved around. That's correct. And it includes hospital and health care facilities. Does that include the cafeteria for employees? We don't regulate um, hospitals at this point. It's done by New York State Department of Health. Okay. We regulate uh, third party providers in hospitals. So if you open to the hospital lobby, uh, we would regulate that. Or if you had a cafeteria, that exclusively serves the public, you would regulate that. And, but to answer your question, it wouldn't apply to that cafeteria that served the public, just because the people in the hospital were being fed by the hospital. Okay. Okay. But the, the food advisory would still be in effect. Okay. All right, I'd like to thank the group for a uh, sweeping and meticulous review of our board. <laughs> uh, the board is being asked to uh, approve for publication. I have a motion and I have a second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries. And we move now to item six on the agenda, uh, which uh, is a proposal to amend Article 161. And Good morning, I'm uh, Mario Romino, I'm Assistant Commissioner of uh, Veterinary and Pest Control Services, and I have with me uh, Norman Torres, who's the Director of, uh, of Veterinary um, Public Health. Um, so we're going to talk about um, proposed um, changes to health code. Um, Proposal for public public comment uh, 161. Uh, um, okay, so 16101 has a list of animals that are uh, legal in New York, including wild wild animals, exotic animals, tigers, etc., and, and uh, agricultural animals, cows, you know, sheep. Um, if you so, those are illegal. If you want to bring those animals into New York for a show, an opera, um, TV show, etc. cetera, um, we give you a temporary um, animal exhibition permit. Um, those permits are handed out all the time. Uh, they take about uh, five days. Sometimes you do them overnight because um, people don't do a lot of planning. Um, but if you see, you know, if you see animals on a, on a morning talk show, um, most likely um, uh, the producers got a permit from us. Um, Two groups in the health code are exempt from the requirement for the temporary permit. Um, both of them are uh, have licenses from the USDA under the uh, Animal Welfare Act. Uh, one group is uh, wildlife rehabilitators. Wildlife rehabilitators uh, treat and bring back to health 
wildlife, right? So they can we figured they could be exempt, um, and we weren't regulating that activity. Um, and over the past two years, however, we've seen at least one person use that exemption and then claim uh, that they were exempt, but yet uh, have doing a, a show uh, with a with a wild animal. And in that in that instance, it, it was a bear. And the show that they did wasn't particularly safe because they, they took the bear and they had the bear in the crowd and that sort of thing. Uh, but they claimed an exemption uh, because they had a wildlife rehabilitator license. Uh, so we are proposing that uh, if you, regardless of whether you have a wildlife rehabilitator's license, that you get an animal exhibition uh, permit um, if you're going to do a show. The other group that's been exempt is uh, circuses. Um, again, um, there are uh, they they have a Class C. Uh, um, permit from the USDA. USDA does do inspections of circuses, um, usually in their home state where the circus is located. And, and I want to say um, large circuses like Ringling Brothers have voluntarily received, uh, sought, and been given uh, animal exhibition permits. Um, however, uh, um, we we had an incident over the past year where um, it came to our attention, and we talked about it a little bit in the end of the line, um, where uh, a circus came in, um, was not going to get a permit from us, but we found out that um, some of the elephants they had had not been properly tested for TB. TB is a big problem in elephants, also a big problem in people. Um, so that was a, a big concern. Um, the other um, issues came up when we looked at the site. Um, they, they didn't have good separation between the wild animals, the elephants and tigers, et cetera, and the, and the crowd. Um, so. Uh, you know, it, what we think is that USDA does, probably does a great job when they when they do their inspections and they do paperwork checking at the beginning of the year, but they, there's no one checking, you know, on site when, when folks come to New York City with their circuses. So we're um, uh, proposing that we require circuses to get a temp, an animal exhibition permit um, so then we can do um, safety checks and site checks and, and review paperwork. Um, okay, so um, the aforementioned um, list of illegal animals includes uh, ferrets, um, and uh, over the past year, um, we uh, received a um, we received a, a uh, petition from a member of the public that um, ferrets be removed from that illegal animal list, um, and and uh, after reviewing uh, uh, what has happened with ferrets uh, since the last time this was considered um, was considered by the uh, Board of Health, I believe, in the early part of the last decade. Um, and what we found is that uh, you know there, the vaccine uh, is was relatively was was very new the last time this was considered. The concerns about the efficacy of the rabies vaccine. <coughs> you know, rabies vaccine is uh, very important. Um, rabies is uh, you know. Um, uh, there's epizootic in, in New York City um, and, and raccoons and other wildlife. So, uh, you know, we consider rabies that vaccine and any, any kind of pet to be really critical. Um, so, uh, while rabies vaccine was well was new and the last time it was proposed um, to make them legal, uh, there's more experience now with uh, the rabies vaccine. Um, we also um, we looked at the experience of some other states. Uh, rabies are legal in other states, that, uh, including New York State, outside of uh, New York City, legal in New Jersey, um, and a lot of other places. Um, and, and their experience uh, with you know rabies is with not with rabies with ferrets as being um, uh, dangerous animals, and they they were, did not report uh, you know that they were more likely to bite or more dangerous, more prone to attack um, than other than other types of animals. Um, we we have we are um, recommending um, that uh, sterilization be required. Um, sterilization um, will do two things. It'll remove uh, first of all make them less aggressive, it'll also remove glands that make them have a musky odor. Um, and uh, the, the other thing about ferrets, and this is uh, the, the literature that does exist on their propensity to bite 
if, if you go through it, um, there were case studies that were published in the literature at the end of the 80s and in the 90s. Um, they all focus on attacks on, on very young children. Um, so ferrets probably don't make a great pet for folks that have very you know, young ch children. We are recommending, if, if, if you do eventually vote, to remove them from the legal animal uh, uh, list, um, we would come back and, and propose changes to Article 47 that would prohibit ferrets from being in, in uh, child care settings. Okay. Uh, stables, so there, there are two groups of people that we permit around ho commercial horse industry. One group is stable owners, another group is uh, horse owners, so every horse has to have a permit from us, and their owner holds that permit. Um, so currently in the health code, uh, stables are required to keep records of, vaccination records of horses, uh, including rabies vaccination. Um, so we're proposing that the owner also be required to maintain those records, so when we do inspections of stables, we can go to the owner, and the owner should have, have those records. Uh, so um, we just wanted to clarify the word operating in 16102 uh, when it comes to animal handling businesses, including pet shops, that um, when a, an establishment is not yet permitted, but they have animals on the premise, right? Or um, let's say the permit is in transition to another owner, but the animals are on the premise, but they're not permitted, you know, at that point, that, they, that they're still considered operating when they have to follow. The, the safety and, and sanitary provisions of the health. That's a clarification. Um, this is another uh, clarification of 161.15, um, which clarifies what boarding kennels means. Um, and and uh, boarding kennel is defined in the administrative code uh, is any place that has uh, animals being boarded, but also animals being groomed. Uh, exercise, so doggy daycare, groomers uh, um, would, would uh, be defined as a, a boarding kennel. And um, what that means is that they um, would have to have uh, rabies, um, maintain rabies vaccination information on all the animals that are in the, in the premise. And that's very important, right, because even though the animal's not staying overnight in that, in that facility. If it's a groomer, uh, they're still being kept in the facility for a nice number of hours. Not good to have an unvaccinated animal you know, uh, in, in that facility, in that environment, where they're all close together. Um, and that's, in fact, you know, we consider this to be a clarification because, again, it is defined that way in the administrative code. And that's how we define it in enforcement, but we just wanted to make it clear in the health code. Um, the, um, there, there has been a, a change in agri markets law um, that prohibited uh, cage, um, cage and box dryers. And I might need more to help me with this because I'm not all that familiar with it, but honestly, but uh, a, a cage and box dryer is actually an, a heating element inside the cage. And um, they've been used uh, to dry animals quickly in grooming situations. If you leave it on and you walk away from that cage, you could you could kill that animal. So they're 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 not not good for the animals. They've been prohibited. Um, I think, um, as I said, from uh, the ag ag markets law. So uh, this gives us by changing the health code in this way, we can enforce that. Bit. With that, answer questions. Thank you very much, and we're now open for. Comments and discussion about the board. Thank you for that. Um, to clarify, so one of the reasons that ferrets were on the list of animals not allowed, uh, reasons really were a, a fear of increased carriage of rabies, and number two, a concern that they were more likely to attack. Right. Were those the two main That's issues? Right. And it sounds like we've had experience now with the rabies vaccine in ferrets that seems like it is effective, and the rate of attacks of ferrets in the population uh, is not as high as previously perceived? I, I mean, I would say, here's the thing about the rate of attacks. We, we can't, we don't have good data on 
uh, attack rates. If you look at overall number of attacks of different types of animals that people have as, as pets, obviously um, dogs are you know um, at the top of the list in terms of frequency of attacks, having to do with the fact that a lot of people have dogs. Um, we don't have good data on the rate of ferret ownership. So where we or the, or the number of, of ferret owners out there, so that you can calculate a rate and say definitively that you know per ferret owner there's more or less attacks. Um, what we have seen is that ferrets have been legalized. I mean, I would say there's there's been a uh, um, over over a period of time since the late '80s, as ferrets have become legalized in states. There isn't a, a lot of literature that you know there are that ferrets are a problem in terms of attacking more than other types of animals. <laughs> uh, I had a question of something that maybe what was not included here, and it has to do with the uh, organizations that you exempt from getting uh, rabies vaccines. I want to know the rationale <coughs> behind it. Are they not thought you have here, you know, incorporated uh, societies, et cetera, et cetera? On page nine. Let's see. Okay. This is page nine, uh, the exemption. Th those animals are uh, animals that are either in transition, they're in a veterinary hospital receiving care, they're in certain institutions used for different purposes. So for the general population, it's not where you would, you would be concerned with those animals having things. These are mainly our, our vaccine requirements are for owners who have their pets in a different situation, or out with the general public. I see. So the, these the, animals are just they example. don't have any uh, exposure they're, to the general public. Generally, not those that are being well when they're in a veterinary hospital, they're already being cared for and different. So that we wouldn't be looking for these vaccines in that those establishments. The same thing with some of the other uh, associations that are holding animals. Did you have a question, Dr. Yeah, I think I have to go back to the ferrets. <laughs> So, uh, and again, this is, uh, the issue of ferrets has come with, before the board several times during my uh, tenure. I, the, the presentation uh, had a bullet that said something like, it, it seemed like, you know, ferrets are an appropriate urban pet or some such uh, language. I, I, I guess I'd like to hear clearly articulated the, the um, sort of, rationale for making a change. I understand the rabies vaccine issue has now been eliminated as a consideration, but uh, they're so aggressive that you're re recommending that sterilization be required. And it's my understanding, maybe this is mythology, but I, I think I heard this at a former hearing, that because of their somewhat unique skeletal structure, they can squeeze through very small holes and crevices in buildings and so it's easy for them to get away from their owners and given the danger that they pose to young children I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand why this is something we would support you know what, what's the upside it, it, it's a good it's a good question um, I um, the, well, let me just put it this way I think uh, um, we, we were recommending um, that we open up for public comment. Um, and I think it's important maybe to, to hear what the public has to say about, um, about the issue. And we're, you know, we're not you know, sort of arguing uh, for it so much. I think what we're saying is that um, the issue of the rabies vaccine since the, the last, that was a major to me, you know, reading through the testimony and, and uh, um, an accounts of, of prior hearings on this, the, the major issue was the, the questions about the efficacy of the, of the rabies vaccine, which is a, which is a critical uh, thing. Um, and, and certainly, um, any, any companion animal didn't have a, a, a rabies vaccine, I think that would be a sticking point um, for us. Um, I, it, you know, in terms of the dangerousness of ferrets, um, I, I just, there isn't a, a literature or a, a body of evidence 
that we can find that points to them being, you know, way more dangerous than other types of animals. But I, I think, um, you know, they're not, they're not a, a common pet like a cat and, and, and like a dog. And so I, there are limitations in the literature. Um, even if you count the number of ferret bites, you have to take into account the fact that, you know, ferrets are not as, that common. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't see uh, a, a, um, a body of, uh, of evidence in the literature. Um, the other thing we did do is we asked, um, you know, officials, state, state officials, um, informally, you know, if they had, that had legalized ferrets in their state, you know, are you seeing a lot of, a lot of these issues in terms of, you know, ferrets attacking, um, uh, you know, f ferret bites, et cetera, and, and, and um, to a one, they said no. Um, now, we, we didn't do a study, we didn't ask them to do a study, we don't have, you know, so that's a, you know, there's a limitation there. Um, and, and, you know, you're right, I think there, there is, uh, if you read the literature, um, what the literature has to say is all about ferrets attacking younger children, which I, you know, I think, to me, that means, you know, ferrets are, are not a uh, good, um, good choice for uh, families that have young children. Um, in, in turn, and it's a good point. Um, uh, the, the, the notion that ferrets can get away and get two younger children or get out of, uh, you know, an apartment into another apartment, you know, is that a concern? I mean, I, I uh, you know, it could be, um, I, I will say this, I think um, the, the AVMA and the, you know, uh, uh, ASPCA, you know, uh, all recommend that, that no small child should be left alone with you know, any kind of, any pet. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's sort of a universal concern for all, for all pets. Um, the notion that the ferrets are special because they can, they can get away, I, that could be real. I, I haven't found evidence of that, but I mean, it, it's, not, it's not inconceivable with that. Something like that could happen. But it, I think, you know, any situation where, you know, and, and folks should be cautious, in order to be cautious, you know, they should, they should, if they have small children, they shouldn't be left alone with any, with any pet. May I ask, uh, I, I believe that in the proposed, uh, in the proposal, you noted that the ferret should be on a harness, I assume it would be a harness, should be leashed. In public. You know, in public, is that correct? Yeah. Um, can you say anything, sort of in follow-up to Dr. Richardson's, um, Remark about the uh, about the likelihood of establishing a feral ferret uh, population. You know, um, um, it's, one, it's one of the reasons why we, we we want to have them all be sterilized. Um, I I think it's a concern for more warm weather. Um, what we what we heard and, um, and read was that it's unlikely that we would have feral. Um, ferrets in New York just because it's too cold for them to survive. Um, but, you know, uh, the notion of having an <coughs> population of them is, and then, and then potentially having feral colonies is, is a concern. And that's why I think, you know, any, any type of allowing them, you know, should be accompanied by, you know, requiring that they be sterilized. And any other questions from the board? I think that uh, Dr. Richardson's question, to me, also um, makes me concerned. And I guess the, my, I, I wondered if we could do a little bit better job of getting the kind of data that would establish whether or not ferrets are any more dangerous or pose a greater risk than other animals that are already allowed as legal animals in New York City, which includes plenty of dogs, for instance, that we know are, tend to attack. Um, people including, and particularly young children. Mm -hmm. So if there's such widespread uh, legalization of this, I would, I would hope we could get a little bit stronger data one way or the other to help guide our decision. I, it, I too wish for <laughs> data. Um, I, I, uh, you know, we, we did look at that and, and, uh, and, and like I said, I mean, I, I don't have that with me um, and it, it wasn't 
you know, wasn't readily available on, in our search, but, um, you know, that, so, uh, you know, that's something that we, we would have to sort of pursue and then come back and, and try to provide that. Dr. Klitzman, thank you for uh, picking up the gauntlet here on this, <laughs> what has continued to be a challenging issue for the board. Um, I too read the proposal and had a similar reaction to Dr. Richardson. I thought to myself, well, okay, it's not so much we're saying that legalizing domestic ferrets is serving any particular public health goal, but rather whether it would pose any significant additional public health risk. Uh, so that to me is really the question that we're being asked to, to evaluate. Um, um, although today our, our charge is simply to uh, approve or not for public comment. Um, but I guess I just wanted to understand, <clears throat> am I correct that you're not proposing um, licensing domestic ferrets, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So then how would you track um, ownership and compliance? Uh, you know, it's a really good question. No, there would be no um, ferret uh, license. Uh, um, compliance with the, with the rabies requirement. Um, vaccination reportable under um, ARC 11 um, to the health department by the um, veterinarians. So that's one way to do it. Um, the other um, way we do it is when we, when we find uh, ferrets, we see ferrets in, in the pub, in public, um, or we, we um, act on complaints. Um, there, you know, we, we answer complaints all the time. Which, by the way, um, last year there were five, um, five or six ferret complaints in New York City um, that were related to legal, legal animal complaints and, and odors. Uh, um, but we do react to complaints from the public. Everything from you know animals are making too much noise to odors. And if we find in those complaints that those animals aren't um, vaccinated, whether it's a you know ferret or cat or a dog. Um, we, we would we would hand them a, a summons. Can I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, Dan, Dan pointing out that um, uh, uh, so um, when we receive reports of bites and we, we follow up on those reports of a bite, we would that we would they would receive a summons um, if uh, and, and you know we, we do have a, a bite surveillance system um, where uh, ferret um, bites or, or any kind of animal bite. These reported that system is over over four thousand bites a year, um, which, which by the way, since two thousand seven, I found four reports of ferret bites in that time. But again, they're you know ferrets are illegal in New York. But on, when we when we investigate those bite complaints, we would enforce the the rabies um, requirement at that point. Sorry. So so <coughs> just to follow through on that, if uh, you determined that the ferret did bite someone and it had rabies vaccine, is that the end of the story? Uh, yeah, uh, any biting animal we, in the ferret falls under the same, it requires a 10-day observation period. So we would be following up with the owner to make sure the um, animal is in good health 10 days after the bite. And then that's the end of it? Pretty much, okay. unless there's, uh, we might look at the circumstances surrounding the bite if there's some um, if the animal is running free or open when it should have been restrained, we look at some conditions of uh, blood current. And let's say you've got a complaint now or under these provisions of uh, an odor in a department related to ferrets. How would that be handled? You know, um, odors uh, really are handled under general uh, nuisance. Um, Article, six, uh, Article 3, um, the department um, gets some, somewhere around 5,000 animal odor complaints in New York City, um, and, and that includes p uh, pigeon complaints as well. Um, so if, it, if there's an odor outside the property, it's considered a nuisance, and, and the, 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 uh, the owner of that property could be subject to a fine. And what's the remedy for that, in addition to the fine? Well, and, you know, they, they can, they're subject to, other, um, they're subject to other, other inspections and continuation of the um, um, we don't do remediation um, in the case of odors, um, uh, you know. But um, there is the fine, and, and 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 you know we do notify the owner of the property, and a lot of times that helps the situation. Thank you. 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 Th
It's also a nuisance authority too, correct? We can order, we can, we can order the person to abate the nuisance. That's what we do. Yeah. That's how we enforce those. Thank you. Can I just follow up on Dr. Klitzman's question? So, um, you do require licenses for other common household pets, at least dogs. I presume maybe cats. I don't actually know, but I guess. But dogs, yes. Yes. I guess they're often taken out of the house, and cats traditionally aren't. Although sometimes I see people walking cats. Um, I guess the questions I have related to that are: one, in jurisdictions that have legalized ferrets, have they experienced a large increase in the number of ferrets, or do they have any idea? And the reason I ask is, why not propose licensing? Because what you describe is a way of monitoring adherence to um, the requirements for <coughs> the vaccination for rabies, and I would add the sterilization requirement might be much better served by licensing up front. But I worry that maybe it would be very burdensome or expensive to do it if you really expected many, many ferrets. But if you didn't really, at least initially, it might make me more comfortable if I had more confidence that you'd be on top of growth in the ferret population. Um, so we did, we, again, we did some informal survey of, of other state jurisdictions that allowed the ferrets. And I, I can't recall who that included that question. Did they see a lot, a lot of them being piece of ferrets? No, but because there's no way of estimating that. There, nobody keeps. So, I, I, if you're going to make a substantive comment, you need to come up and introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Answers now. Right, answers we don't know. So, uh, in, in terms of um, licensing the ferrets, um, it, uh, we, so we, to answer your question, um, we, we do not license cats. Um, there are there are communities that do license cats. Um, we only license dogs. Um, we. Uh, we're we're prevented from doing anything around um, dog licensing because of state law. Um, the um, within uh, hours, I think um, we heard that um, the governor was going to sign a, a law at the state level that would change that and give New York City the, the ability to to manage its own dog licensing. Um, so um, we're considering a bunch of changes to the, the to dog licensing. Um, I think I think licensing. You know, so it, I don't know how much I want to say about it because it's a it's a big policy question and it could have it, it could have benefits. It's, the drawbacks are um, that it, it is a it is a cost to to pet owners and um, so I. Yes. And can you point out uh, and then uh, Dan Cass will join us. Can you just point out to the board what proportion of dog owners uh, currently? Uh, we we think it's under twenty percent right now. Under. Yeah. I, this is, I'm Dan Cass, I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health. I just wanted to add a couple of comments. What's that? thought. No, it's okay, I can, I can kneel. <laughs> no, I, will, I will not be second place. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, you know, the principal uh, additional value of licensing for dogs right now, um, beyond sort of responsible ownership and, uh, and vaccinating the animal, is to uh, do two things. The first is to uh, help you know, reimburse the cost to the city of managing, you know, everything from bite surveillance to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, investigating animal <coughs> nuisances as well as uh, operating uh, humane shelters for uh, lost or abandoned animals. The second one is to reunite a dog with its owner if it's lost. Um, we have specifically built into this notice of intent uh, of a fairly long window of time before ferrets would actually become legal in part to enable uh, property owners, the parks department, <coughs> other entities, uh, an opportunity to consider whether they themselves want to issue rules that would limit the ability of, uh, of ferrets to be in, uh, in their properties or, out, or further outdoors. We don't believe at this point that should this be, should ferrets be legalized, that there would be a wide proliferation of of ferrets outside. Uh, they would li li likely be complained in person. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments from the board? If not, uh, may I have a motion to approve this for publication? Dr. Klitzman, I have a motion, a second. Dr. Caro, all in favor? 
Do we have, was that unanimous or? We used, yes, yeah. all in favor. So this is approved <laughs> for publication, public comment. I believe the public comment, uh, it, the public hearing will be on the 21st of January. All of these uh, that we've approved today will be in the second part of January. Uh, thank you all. We now uh, come to the final item on the agenda, which is uh, a proposal to amend Section 205.03, the reporting of deaths, and 207.13, vital statistics. Um, welcome back, <laughs> Assistant Commissioner. And reintroduce yourself. I'm Stephen Schwartz, the New York City Registrar. And, and Charged with following that act. <laughs> I'll I apologize. I've, missed, I've misspoken your title. Uh, welcome back, Register I will try to bring the conversation back down to earth and talk about <laughs> our electronic death registration system. And some ideas that we're proposing to, in fact, improve it. <clears throat> New York City is a leader in electronic death registration and has been. We are, we have 94% of all of the deaths reported completely electronically <clears throat> using our electronic death registration system. We want to do even better, both in terms of <coughs> increasing the proportion of deaths that are reported electronically and we also want to increase the speed of that reporting. So as the board well knows, <clears throat> death reporting is a, is a very important public health function. And it's not just important to New York City. It is, of course, the source of all death data. In addition, we report our data to the National Center for Health Statistics of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And CDC is interested in actually speeding up the use of electronic death registration systems, making them more functionally important for actually disease surveillance and death reporting systems nationally. So as good as our system is, we want to make it better. Currently, the requirement is that medical certification has to happen within 24 hours. And if there's a funeral record involved, another 48 hours for a total of 72 hours to report the death to us. <coughs> So electronic death registration certainly helps that. And we'll talk about what we're doing to improve that. But in addition, we funeral directors are really important players in the reporting of deaths. So that even if a medical certifier certifies that death within 24 hours, it is not reported, it is not registered with us until a funeral director reports that. So, and what we found is that there's actually a delay between the report, between the medical certification and the funeral director actually completing the registration. And we cannot send those data to NCHS, National Center for Health Statistics, until it is registered with us. And CDC's goal is actually to get reports of death within five calendar days. So we like to think we're doing well when we're working five days a week. And currently our system, in fact, doesn't automatically report deaths over the weekend. So it's a challenge on how to do better because we have 94% of our deaths electronically registered. What we're proposing is that right now we have facilities reporting deaths, um, any facility reporting 25 or more deaths a year has to do so electronically. And, and if the certificate is started electronically, it must be completed electronically. 
motion we're proposing to reduce the number 25 down to 10, and that would apply to any facility reporting deaths. 10 or more deaths a year would have to do so electronically. We will expand the category to include skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we will require that once reporting starts electronically, that is, a facility starts reporting electronically, it will continue to report electronically. And finally, to improve the speed at which the death actually gets reported to the health department, fully registered with us, we are proposing to actually eliminate a fee which we find has been a barrier to the reporting, to the speedy reporting for by funeral directors. Funeral directors, right now, funeral directors essentially handle more than half of the death data come from funeral directors, all the personal particulars, demographic information. Another portion of the death certificate includes the burial permit process and the disposition. So typical dispositions are burial, cremation, transport out of the city. The health code also provides for a category called interim disposition. An interim disposition uh, is very useful for us in keeping track of where a body is. For example, a medical school may have a cadaver, and what we found years ago was that the medical school would be reporting the place of disposition for that cadaver as Hart Island City Burial, even though the body was at medical school and might be there for a year or more. So we created through the health code, a category called interim disposition. So essentially, it facilitates the department knowing where a body is. The challenge we realized is that there's a, we had enacted, a board had enacted a fee for any changes to the death certificate. And so that change fee is $40. So that presents a problem for the, a real world problem for businesses, funeral homes, who are processing deaths and death certificates. So funeral directors are reluctant, understandably so, they're reluctant to file a certificate with us that will then require a fee to change that. So what we're proposing is to eliminate that fee if it's going essentially from private to another private burial, so, or to a final disposition. So for example, what we would like and what we feel our proposal will encourage will be that funeral directors will enter if a family has not made up its mind about the disposition, as often happens, so families are complex, multiple family members haven't decided, we want the death certificate reported to us quickly. If a family hasn't decided what, whether the disposition is cremation, burial, transport, or they may just be discussing it, our family members are not always available, it takes a while for them to assemble and make a decision, a lot of that is also uh, affected by cost. So a decision may change from going from burial to cremation based on cost. So we want to accommodate that and still encourage really rapid reporting. So to do that, we want to eliminate the fee that, that a, either a family or a funeral home would incur if they were to put interim disposition as the funeral home. And maybe the, and then that body may be stored there for a week or multiple weeks. But we'll know about it. We will have, and the health code 
provides for that. Similarly, bodies are stored for periods of time at the medical examiner's office. So essentially, this would enable us to encourage, by removing a barrier, a fee, so encourage fast reporting, let them report as an interim disposition, no fee to change going from an interim disposition to a final disposition, and we'll get our data faster. So that's our simple proposal. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're going to make it more widely available to smaller reporters and to remove the fee for interim disposition. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? You were first. There we go. Um, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, for the uh, the funeral homes or the entities that will uh, be included now to be re reporting electronically, uh, having uh, ten uh, uh, processed a year, um, will, will there be any any capital expenditures they'll need to um, to, to have done in, in order to to uh, process electronically, or is it simply an online portal? It is online, and. 94% of deaths are already reported electronically. <clears throat> the only piece of equipment that's needed for a reporter to certify either a funeral home or a medical certifier is a, is a fingerprint recognition device, which is $100 or less. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Richardson. Uh, thank you uh, for that presentation. So, do we know now about how often uh, there is, a, how often the disposition is an interim disposition that later needs to be changed? Can you just give an idea? Is it 5%, 20%? It's used relatively infrequently now, and we feel it's because they would prefer not to touch the paper or the electronic record. <laughs> and so essentially, they delay the reporting. And you feel that most of this delay is over the issue of disposition as opposed to gathering the needed demographic information and so on? Is it that they don't want to, again, they don't want to file it, it's incomplete, or it turns out, you know, there was a middle name, but the, and so, so is it really over the disposition that's causing the delay? Is that? your understanding? Yes. The, when a funeral director is involved, the funeral director gets that information quite quickly. And it turns out the $40 fee is a huge impediment. And we recognize that. We met with funeral directors about this. And imagine this, they were thrilled at the opportunity <laughs> to have interim dispositions and not have a fee. Would the fee still apply to any other changes in the death certificate? Are you only waiving it for this disposition change? That's correct. That's correct. The, the, the other fees will remain for other corrections. Essentially, that portion of the death certificate that pertains to the place of disposition, only that portion essentially will be exempt. I see no other questions uh, around the table. If, may I have a motion then to approve the publication of this proposed amendment? Then that has to be approved for publication? Yes. yes. It is a rule change. It's a rule change, yes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. It passes. Thank you. Oh, and there's one more thing. Sorry, I, we have um, we have to um, hear about some proposed form changes. Are these being? Are we asked to approve these at this time? Yes. You are. Um, okay. They're not. They weren't on. I apologize. They weren't on the original agenda that went out. But um, and these, this is not rulemaking. But this is just that I mean, to one of your roles is to approve any form that the uh, Division of Public Records uses.
So welcome back. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Gretchen Van Lai. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Vital Statistics. Um, so previously, at our October Board of Health meeting, um, we proposed a change to the transgender birth certificate, which is form BR13. You approved that change in October. Um, and essentially what we did was remove the reference to a specific, the, the specific section of the health code that pertains to transgender birth certificates. We changed it to be more general um, language, and that is what is our current certificate. Today we are now proposing um, that we use uh, a single form, the vr 11 e for both paternities and gender marker changes, or transgender birth certificates. So the, the form vr 11 e is um, currently used for paternities. Um, what we are asking for is that um, the vr 11 e be used for both paternities and gender marker changes, and that we eliminate the VR13. Um, we're making some additional recommendations as well. Um, we're asking that the reference to both the Health and Administrative Code on vr 11 e is also removed. So now it reads, this certificate is filed pursuant to Section 17167 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York and Section 20705 of the New York City Health Code. We propose that there is no reference at all to codes. Now we're doing, making this proposal because we believe that removing the text further protects the privacy of registrants with amended paternity or gender marker um, changes. These are seal and replace birth certificates and they'll, they're in the same category and so now um, the birth certificates will match. We're also proposing to remove text that says corrected certificate um, in the box, um, which I will show you in a moment. Um, the reason why we're proposing to remove this text um, is again to further protect the privacy of registrants. And then finally, we're proposing to remove extraneous text from the left-hand margin of the vr 11 e We had actually re uh, proposed and you had approved the removal of this extraneous text in October. So this is what the current VR13, the transgender birth certificate, looks like. Um, you can see that the highlighted area, the area in yellow, um, is what we're asking to, we're proposing to remove in general, but overall we're actually asking to remove this entire this form itself. But this highlighted area is the reference to the health code and the text that says corrected certificate. This is the current VR 11 e This is the, um, the form that currently covers paternities that we're asking to um, move to. All of the yellow text is the text that we propose to remove. It references both the administrative code and the health code. Um, we're proposing to remove the place where it says corrected certificate um, and the extraneous text on the left-hand margin. Finally, this is what the proposal is for the new certificate of birth for um, registrants who are both transgender and who've had a paternity amendment. Um, this will have a common purpose, so we'll have two uses for one certificate. It will remove any text that might refer to um, the general category of the health code that covers paternities or transgender. Um, and it also removes um, that text that says corrected, so that it's clear that, um, uh, or so that's just completely removed and it's per further preserves the privacy um, of all registrants in this category, but especially transgender registrants. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? One question. So I just want to make sure I understand yes. this correctly. Yes. Is there a different um, birth certificate for people who don't fall into either of these two categories? There is. There's a different right. form. Okay. Yes. So if someone has a VR11E, mm -hmm. um, that is a signal that it's mm -hmm. either a paternity or a transgender. transgender. That, that is correct. And we handle about 20,000 um, paternity amendments a year, so that's quite a large category. We handle about 20 transgender mm -hmm. amendments a year. So this is a way of um, making that a much larger category, um, but still having the, the, the area where we can record that this is an official birth certificate that has um, been signed off on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, I've asked the board to, for a motion to approve these form changes. And the second. Second. And uh, all in favor? Aye. Right. Approved. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you all.
Uh, that brings uh, to a close today's meeting. I want to wish everybody a safe and healthy holiday season. Uh, thank you. We are adjourned.